Hello everyone, and welcome back to lecture 7 of our introductory course to quantum computing. In today's lecture, we'll be talking about quantum circuits, specifically what they are, how they're represented, and how you can sort of understand and interpret them. So first, let's clear up what a quantum circuit actually is. A quantum circuit is simply a series of quantum gates and measurements, so they're not as complicated as you might think. They can be any assortment of gates and measurements, and therefore they can be both quite simple and also become very complex. Now let's take a look at how the single qubit quantum gates that we've covered during our lectures are represented in quantum circuits. So first we have the X gate, which as you can see, is simply a box with an, uh, a box with an X in the middle of it. Secondly, we have our Z gate, which, like the X gate, is a box, but this time there's a Z in the middle of it. And finally, we have the Hadamard gate, which, like the two gates before, is simply a box with an H in the middle of the box. So we can see that our single qubit quantum gates are represented quite simply in quantum circuits. So now, let's take a look at how the C0 gate is represented on quantum circuits. So recall that the CNOT gate is a two qubit quantum gate, which allows us to create quantum entanglement. <laughs> if the control qubit is zero, then the target qubit is unchanged. However, if the control qubit is one, then the target qubit has an X gate applied to it, meaning that it just flips its state. So to represent the CNOT gate, we have two circles connected by a line in between them. The bottom circle, or the filled-in circle, uh, is the control qubit. Uh, the control qubit is not necessarily always on the bottom, and can be on the top as well. However, it is always the filled-in circle. The target qubit is a circle with a plus sign in the middle, and as mentioned before, these two circles are connected by a line to signify how they are connected. Finally, let's take a look at how measurement and identity is represented. So measurement is primarily represented by a box with a curve and an arrow going through that curve in the middle. The measurement typically varies in quantum circuits, but most measurement will have the sort of arc with a, at least a line going through that arc in the middle of a box. Second, we have identity, which I'll go over in the next slides, but identity is represented with simply a box with an I in the middle of the box. So when taking a look at identity, let's just take a look at the identity matrix first. So for a single qubit, the identity matrix is simply a two by two matrix with a one and a zero on the top and a zero and a one on the bottom. However, for those who are well-versed in linear algebra, will know that the identity matrix extends beyond a two by two matrix and can theoretically be any matrix of size n by n, where you have a 1 down the diagonal, as seen in the 2 by 2 matrix, with zeros in every single other spot. And we'll take a look at what the identity matrix actually does to a qubit on the following slides. Now, let's take a look at what happens when we apply the identity matrix to the zero state. So, as with our other single qubit quantum gates, we have the identity matrix on the left, multiplied by, on the right, the zero state. When we multiply out these two two by two, or these two matrices, we get on the top, one times one plus zero times zero, and on the bottom, zero times one plus one times zero. And when we add these values up, we get one on the top and zero on the bottom. Now, this same thing happens when we apply the identity matrix to the one state, in that when we apply the identity matrix to the one state, we get back the one state. So the identity matrix doesn't actually do anything to a qubit. Instead, in some quantum circuits, you'll see it as a placeholder for some people who like to keep quantum gates in sort of columns to represent that they're all being applied at the same time. And when a qubit is not being uh, acted upon by a quantum gate, they might use the identity matrix to represent that. 
So now let's take a look at some quantum circuits. So on the left, we have uh, the qubit and its number. So quantum computers and quantum circuits follow zero-based indexing a lot of the time. So this means that the first qubit is qubit zero and the second qubit is qubit one. Below these two qubits, we have C, which represents the classical register. A lot of times when quantum states are measured, they are stored in classical bits, which is why we have a classical register. Extending out from each qubit are wires, which connect quantum gates. These wires simply show the order in which quantum gates are being applied. So now let's take a look at what hap what's happening with qubit zero. So first we have an X gate applied to qubit zero, then we have another X gate applied to qubit zero, and finally qubit zero is measured and stored in classical bit zero. So it's worth mentioning that a lot of qubits, or all qubits in this case, uh, are initialized in state zero. So if you want to uh, start a quantum state in state one, you have to apply an X gate to the qubit. But in this case, we have two X gates being applied to qubit zero, and then qubit zero is being measured. So this means that we would, when qubit zero is measured, we'd get back uh, the zero state with 100% certainty, and this information is stored on classical bit zero. Here is another quantum circuit. So in this case, we are applying a Hadamard gate to qubit zero, followed by an identity, and then a measurement. And we are storing the information on qubit zero on classical bit zero. Obviously, we can also measure qubit one if we wanted, but just for simplicity, we're only measuring qubit one in, the, in this quantum circuit. So when we apply the Hadamard gate to qubit zero, we're putting it into a uniform superposition in the plus state as we are applying the Hadamard gate to the zero state. Then we apply an identity, which means that nothing happens to the quantum state, so we are still in the plus state in the uniform superposition. Finally, we measure qubit zero, which means that we have a 50% chance of collapsing into state zero and a 50% chance of collapsing into state one, meaning that the state that qubit zero collapses into is random with a 50-50% chance of landing in qubit in state zero and state one. This information is finally stored on classical bit zero. Now let's take a look at the final quantum circuit that I've prepared. So in qubit zero, we have an X gate applied to it. And then we have a C naught gate applied to qubit zero and qubit one. Qubit 1 is the control qubit, while qubit 0 is the target qubit. And because all qubits are initialized in state 0, this means that qubit 1 is also in state 0. The control qubit, which is qubit 1, is in state 0, so this means that qubit 0 state remains unchanged, meaning that it is still in state 1. Finally, qubit 0 is measured and stored on classical bit 0. We know that qubit zero is still in state one. So the information stored in classical bit zero would always be one with 100% certainty. So here are some final things to note before we end off the lecture. As mentioned before, all of your qubits are initialized in the state zero. So if there's no quantum gate applied to it, it will still be in state zero. Secondly, we tend to store our qubits outside of quantum states on classical bits as quantum states lose their information very quickly due to decay from the environment and other factors. And finally, a lot of you may start out uh, creating quantum circuits using drag and drop blocks. However, for a lot of quantum algorithms, it's often easier to use code in order to uh, create these quantum circuits as a lot of times there will be a repetition of a certain process and you don't want to continuously drag and drop blocks and instead you could use a for loop instead when you're coding. So this is the end of the seventh lecture. And in the next lecture, we'll be talking about the quantum stack, including quantum hardware and quantum software. We'll see you then and have a nice day.